I'm honored now to introduce Carol Stern. We'll be talking, Carol Stern, we'll be talking about uh, the challenges and opportunities for philanthropy in the post COVID era and leaving us you know, with some food for thought, maybe with some action items to take home with us. As the ex executive director of the Walton Family Foundation, one of the largest foundations in the world, Carol is one of the most important philanthropic leaders today. Before leading the Walton Family Foundation, she was president and CEO of UNICEF USA. She was named one of 25 women changing the world by People Magazine, and has also been very vocal about the impact her Jewish and Zionist values have had on her philanthropic activities. So we at JFN are honored to have you here with us today. Thank you, Carol. Welcome. So when they were saying the keynote speaker was a man, I was getting a little worried there for a minute. But uh, thank you for the introduction, and it really does feel good to be back with the family. And it's been a really wonderful past 24 hours reconnecting with a lot of old friends, and so thank you for having me. When I first got the call asking me if I would speak today, I said, well, we want to talk about it. And he said, well, tell your story, tell about why you do what you do, what you've seen in the field, maybe what you see coming down the pike. So I'm going to try to do that. But the big thing I heard was that don't go over 20 minutes and we'll pull you off the stretch. So I, um, I have a picture that stays in my mind pretty much with everything that I do. And it is a picture of a little girl who is six years old. And she's standing on a dock holding the hand of a little boy who is four. Year is 1939. They're getting ready to board a ship for a country that neither of them has ever been to, that speaks a language that neither of them speak. And they're traveling with neither their mother nor their father, but only with a woman who is a family friend who that will shelter them to where they're going. The little girl in the picture is my mom, the little boy, her brother. Their parents have had to make the heart-wrenching decision because the Nazis have invaded Vienna that the only way to save their lives is to send them to the United States. They came to this country. They were sheltered here by a woman, a woman who was a family friend whom I never had the privilege to meet, and they were raised in an orphanage on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. But I always wondered about that woman. I always wondered, you know, how did they even ask her? And what made her say yes? And I tried to imagine the responsibility of taking someone else's children on a voyage over an ocean, away from their parents when they've never spent a night away from home before. So I think about her courage, and I think about her humanity. And I also think about how with that one amazing act of kindness, she gave my mother the gift of life. And as a result, she gave me the gift of life. And so throughout my career, whenever I'm asked, you know, so what inspired you? Why did you go into what you did? I always say it's the lessons that I got from my mom and from a woman whose name I don't even know. It's a lesson, though, that one person, one person can and often does make the difference. It's that one person. And from the moment our arms were strong enough to hold a sign, my mother reinforced that message. She took us to every march on everything that she believed. She taught us the meaning of Takun Alam at the dinner table, at the breakfast table, on our way to school every day. She taught us what the freedom of this country had given her. And she taught us that our voices mattered. And when she also taught us that we not only had the opportunity to stand up to injustice, but that it was our obligation to stand up to injustice. And it's why I feel really privileged that I've gotten to spend 45 years of my career doing just that. And it's an amazing thing at this age, in my kind of swan song year, to look back on that and to feel really, really grateful. So after 10 years in academia, Abe Fox then called me and offered me an opportunity to come to the ADL. 
And I was really proud to be the founding director of the World of Difference Institute, an anti-bias project in the years ago. <laughs> When people didn't know what anti-bias curricula were, you'd have to go to a school and first explain it and then convince them to do it. And it's unbelievably fulfilling to me to know that to date, more than 450,000 teachers have gone through that curriculum, reaching over 20 million young people around the world. So really amazing. And I had the privilege then, 18 years later, while serving as the Chief Operating Officer at ADL to get a call from UNICEF. Now, I'll be honest, the first two letters in that name made me hesitate to take the call. But I did take it, and I said to UNICEF, why would a nice Jewish girl like me want to come run UNICEF? And they said to me, well, because we'll take you to Africa, we'll put a baby in your arms, we'll teach you how to inoculate that child, and if you do nothing else for the rest of your life, there will be a child in Africa alive because of you. And it felt full circle, so I did a lateral move, and I became the Chief Operating Officer for UNICEF. Three weeks later, my boss got an offer from Bill Gates, and I found myself as the acting CEO, and a year later had the privilege to become the CEO, to be the CEO of an organization that has saved the lives of more children than any other organization in the world in some of the most difficult places, to work in Haiti after the earthquake, Sierra Leone, to work in the drought, and to watch my colleagues who are still in Ukraine today. And in early 2020, just a few weeks before the pandemic, I joined the Walton Family Foundation. I believe you leave a job, I called it my Seinfeld moment. You go out while they still want another episode. And so I, I left and went to Walton. And I went there because Sam and Helen Walton's vision was to create something that would bring their family together to give back. Yes, we work in a lot of areas, but their primary vision was, we're going to bring the family together to give. And I am thrilled to work for a family that still honors what Sam and Helen started, and to see that really come alive every day in their work. So in 2021, the foundation embarked on a new five-year strategy. And at the heart of it, our theme is learning and leading together. Recognizing we don't have all the answers. We may be the largest foundation or amongst the largest in the world, but we surely don't have all the answers. And we accept and we embrace the fact that although our resources are deep, even if we had the answers, we can't tackle the problems by ourselves. Our view of collaboration recognizes that a fundamental truth, that lasting change, has to be driven by the voices and the needs of the people and the communities where we work. And so we are really at the heart of what we do, trying to build those collaborations. We prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion. We recognize that too many people are excluded from decisions that directly impact their lives. But collaboration also requires that all of us who are funders in this room and doers in this room, that we stop working in silos. We not only need to work together in partnership, but we also need to step outside our sector and be willing to work with others in the other sectors. And I saw this firsthand after the storm in Puerto Rico. I was called upon, I was CEO of UNICEF at the time, to bring in a response in a place where I had no staff and I had never worked. I had been on vacation quite honestly in Puerto Rico. That's all I knew. And I didn't know how to respond because I had no staff there. So I looked to see what others were doing and I saw that the New York State governor had actually gotten on a plane and gone down and asked, what do you need? How can we help? Or others just made assumptions. And so I picked up the phone and I called him and said, okay, we want to work with you. How can we help? And he told me that, you know what, I cleared warehouse space at JFK. I've got the, the Attorney General of the State of New York vetting organizations on the ground that could do distribution. But he said, I've never done disaster response. I don't know what to collect and put in the warehouse. I don't know how to pay for it. I have no way to get it from here to there. The CEO of UPS had literally joined the UNICEF board that week. 
and he was coming the next day for orientation. He never got oriented. <laughs> he walked in, I said, this is what the governor's got. And UNICEF, we know how to raise money, and we even know what they need, and I even know where the stuff they need is, but it's in Italy. He said, no problem. We've got boats, we've got ships, and we are the logistics kings of the world, and we will help you plot that whole thing out. He said, and I, but it's going to take getting some very special laws moved more quickly than they normally do because to get the custom clearance, to get it from Italy, to get it to the US, to get it to Puerto Rico. So then I called the governor back. <laughs> the three of us sat in the room. I will tell you, not only did the UPS CEO offer all of that, but he also told us he had 500 drivers on the ground and 500 trucks, and they had fuel. And if you remember after the storm in Puerto Rico, no one had fuel, they had fuel. UNICEF raised the money, the governor cleared the customs, UPS would tr literally with chainsaws in trucks to cut down trees that were blocking roads, got the supplies to the furthest place in Puerto Rico, and none of us <laughs> It taught me a really big lesson though. It taught me to learn how to say, I don't know how to do this, do you know how to do that? It taught me the importance of coming together to solve the problems, and we've got problems to solve. I think the most promising ideas today, though, spring from our youngest advocates, the Gen Zs, the Millennials, and we have got to listen. I think it's really easy when you reach my age to say, I've done that, I know how to do that, and I am learning, you know what? I might have done that, but boy, you don't do it that way anymore. So, we have to listen, and we not only have to listen to their ideas, but their concerns, and their dreams, and their ambitions. We did some research last year on Gen Z and Millennials, and what I thought we would hear is not what we heard. We heard optimism, not pessimism. This is the generation that has lived through such trying times. We heard determination, not defeatism. We heard self-confidence, not self-doubt. The research, which was conducted by Echelon Insights, revealed that most young Americans believe that their generation has what it takes to meet the social, cultural, and the economic challenges that we face today. About 70% say that they believe their generation, not others, will play the biggest role in the history of this country in overcoming the barriers to a brighter future. And seven in 10 believe that they personally will be able to move up the economic ladder and lead a better life than their parents did. Seven in 10. The biggest thing I learned from them was that they still believe in the American dream. They just don't believe that America's gonna provide the opportunity for them. They believe they're gonna make it happen themselves. And I think as funders, we need to recognize that and think about then how we invest in their ability to do it themselves. I think the challenges that face us were made even more profound by COVID. For one thing, the pandemic exposed the depth of the problems in our nation's schools, and perhaps it took the spotlight off one of the things our foundation is extremely concerned with, climate change. We need urgent action now to confront and manage the threats to clean and abundant water, because otherwise the, their American dream will not happen. We need to reimagine education. We need to understand it doesn't begin and end in a classroom. You know, Condoleezza Rice coined a phrase that we no longer have a school day, we have a learning day. And she's right, it's from the time they wake up till the time they go to bed. And we need to invest from dawn to dusk in the learning of our young people. And we also need to recognize, and it was interesting, I was listening to Andres outside and he made a comment that really resonated with me, you didn't know I was going to say this, but our young people have been traumatized. They have lived through a horror, and we need to recognize that. I remember being in Texas doing uh, relief work for UNICEF a couple months after the storms devastated Texas. I was in a first grade classroom, and it started to rain, and I watched half a class of little first graders crawl under their desks because it was raining. We need to recognize the storm in Texas was felt by every young person in this nation this year through the storm of COVID. 
and pay attention to the psychosocial support of these young people, not just to the academic loss. We also need to recognize that while they might have missed days of school, when we reference in this country the greatest generation, the greatest generation most missed three years of school during World War. So we can and we will find ways to accommodate the days and the losses if we support our nation's young people. We also have to look at how philanthropy is being looked at. According to the Edelman Annual Global Trust Barometer, 50% of people view non-government institutions as a unifying force in society. Non-government institutions, along with businesses, are viewed as more competent, more effective, and more visionary drivers of change. And then according to another Edelman study with the independent sector, 84% of Americans say they are competent in the ability of nonprofits to strengthen society. 65% said that about those of us in philanthropy. So we can't afford it right now to squander the trust that we have. This is our moment. This is our moment to actually make the change we've been all working towards for so long. The independent sector identified partnerships as one of the key drivers of trust in philanthropy. So we've got to roll up our sleeves we got to work directly with our grantees to solve problems. We have to use our voices to advocate for the solutions that we need. But we also need to define collaboration differently than we have in the past. In the past, collaboration has been kind of synonymous with teaming up with those with whom we share complete common ground. If you think about it, that really limits the scope we do. If we only work with those who hold our beliefs, we leave ideas on the table. The reality is our agendas are messy. Nonprofits are messy. The work we do is messy. Our agendas overlap. Decisions that we have to make demand more nuance than I think is a field we've been willing to give in the past. If the problems we face don't fall into these neat little lanes, we can't expect the collaborations to fall into neat little lanes either. Tim Schreiber, the chairman of Special Olympics, and a very dear friend of mine, said, stop looking for common ground. Let's look at common solutions instead. Let's stop debating what we don't agree with and agree that we want to solve the problems and make that more important than what we don't agree with. At our foundation, we try to live really deeply in the middle of that direct, kind of complex reality. And it means that we partner with some pretty strange bedfellows. Our financial support is not a blanket endorsement of every grantee. We fund discrete projects to reach discrete outcomes. Obviously, there is a line, but there are things we won't fund. But in general, we try to look on both sides of the aisle and on both sides of the issues to get to the solutions on the bigger issues. And likewise at UNICEF, and that is where I learned that, where I used to frequently say, the only side I'm on is the side of a child. If I have to work with the Darfur government, I work with them, and if I have to meet with the Janjaweed to get them, in the camp, and we're going to meet with the Janjaweed to get food in the camp. We need to put our children first and our politics second. So, you know, the Talmud teaches us that charity is equal in importance to all the other commandments combined. And the sages teach us, you know, who is wise? The one who learns from every person. So in ending, I want to share kind of the, I don't know, the lesson I guess I've learned from 45 years of work and who I learned it from. I also was asked to please remind you to stay when I'm done because there are some announcements to be made, so I don't want to forget. You did my job. Um, but I learned my lesson from a very young person. I was working in a refugee camp in Jordan, Syrian refugee camp. And when you work in the camps, you get up very early in the morning, 
as the sun is coming up, and you work all day. And you find yourself working harder than you've ever worked in your life. And you don't usually stop. You just work, 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 and then the sun is setting, and you're done. When you wear a blue UNICEF shirt, you're looked at as safe, so you're kind of a pipe piper. And the kids, you know, you do that little elephant walk, you've got kids hanging on your legs and kids on your arms as you're working all day. But there's always some shy kids. There's always the kids who won't quite look you in the eye. They, they tend to walk behind you all day long. You know, you turn around quick and then they turn around quick. They won't let you make eye contact. And on this particular day, I had a little boy, about three or four, walking behind me with his older sister. And she was about 11, maybe 12. She had another sibling, a baby on her hip. When I popped out of my tent early in the morning, there they were, and they followed me all day long. Sun is setting. We realized we never stopped to eat all day, which meant these two children had to eat all day. And you recognize in that moment that they probably usually don't eat all day because they hadn't complained. Well, I don't know about your kids, but my kids, you know, breakfast is not on the table by, you know, eight, nine in the morning. I will hear about it. So, we recognized they hadn't eaten all day, they probably never do. And at one point I had been working in a tent for breastfeeding and we give moms these biscuits that help them keep their nutrition up. And they had given me a biscuit to taste. And I'll be honest, I was really trying hard not to eat carbs. So I had calmed my biscuit and stuck it in my backpack. And so realizing these kids had not eaten, I took the biscuit out of my backpack a little bit of plastic, and they gave it to the little boy. And I expected the little boy to run off real quick and just gobble that little biscuit down. And for the first time, he kind of made eye contact with me, and he smiled. But then he took the, that's the biscuit, and he ripped the wrapper. And the first thing he did is he broke it in half, and he gave half to the baby. And in that moment, 20 of us in blue shirts cried. Because of a little boy who had nothing, no shoes on his feet, no food all day, if he knew enough to give what little he had to the baby, it reminded me of how grateful I am for everything that I have in my life and how grateful we all need to remind ourselves every day that we are in positions to actually be the difference, to be the woman who takes you over the ocean to be the person who makes the decision that will find the solution that will lead us to a better tomorrow. Thank you very much.